So I am Tabitha Tuckett and I am the Web Books Librarian here at University College London. And ordinarily we would have these Web Books Club sessions in our physical reading room with our physical books and we would be very informal and chatting and poring over the books and have a very interesting discussion. It's a bit more difficult to do that online, but we hope that will set an atmosphere that helps you to feel relaxed. In the past few weeks, you've heard me playing the cello, but I'm very, very grateful to our anonymous Rare Books librarian, who is also another cellist, and she has been entertaining us this morning with some beautiful Bach on the cello. Thank you very much. So just a bit more housekeeping. I know we've got a large audience today. If you find that your connection jumps around and if you lose contact, don't worry, just reconnect with the same link and that will put you back into the session. And you can do this as many times as you need to. But I hope that everybody has enough internet connection to hear us. And finally, we're going to have a couple of people speaking today. And at the end, we're going to have questions. So we have the chat on at the moment in the right hand side of the screen. There's a pink bar at the bottom right, a pink symbol. And if you click on that, it will open up the right hand side of your screen. And there's a little speech bubble, a little balloon. And if you have any problems with your um connection or anything like that you can email our wonderful moderators and much many thanks to harriet hale our rare books cataloger and to helen biggs um our, uh, our outreach um officer assistant outreach and they will be behind the scenes uh trying their best to get everybody up and running at the end of the talks, we're going to have some questions. And just to plug our final Rare Books Club online session is next week. And we have four finalists from the book collecting competition across universities at London. Um, and those are students who will be talking little lightning talks, 10 minutes each about their book collections, we have Hungarian illustrations, we have annotated books, we have editions of James Joyce's Ulysses, and we also have uh, somebody talking about early 20th century private press. So do book on Eventbrite for that. So it's 10 past one now, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have Chris Fripp talk to us today about his research on 19th century bindings. I'm going to embarrass him and indicate that he has been not only a pleasure to work with this last year um, as he joined our Rare Books team for the year, but he was also awarded the medal in the librarianship MA at UCL last year for his fantastic work and he's going to talk to us more about that in a minute. And incredibly lucky we have uh, David Pearson today who's going to introduce uh, Chris's talk. Uh, David Pearson, many of you will know, and he um, is a very distinguished book historian and has written one of the definitive works on historical bookbinding, which is fantastic. I'm going to hand over to uh, David now and hope that the audio works OK. And I'm going to hope even more that it works. Um, I take it that that is working. I hope everybody can hear me and see me and if not um somebody's going to wave at me um frantically uh virtually or whatever um thank you tabitha for that um uh, and the kind words um uh, and i'm delighted to have an opportunity to be here today to help to introduce this i think one of the things that we've learned as book historians in recent years is obviously the importance of looking at books and experiencing books as as whole objects uh, at a lot more than just words printed on pages. Uh, we recognize that the individual histories of books, the evidence that they manifest us can tell us so much about 
how books have been used, how they've been valued, how they've been regarded, are all things that we really want to know about books. Because I always think that if you want the, the elevator pitch for book history, what is book history? I think it's about understanding the social impact of books. We want to know uh, what influence they've had on people who've used them in the past. And it's all the copy specific evidence of the book that, that manifests that, that gives us the evidence to help us get the, the windows into those kinds of understandings. And so we've had lots and lots of work going on, I think, in recent years on provenance, on marketing. So we just seem to have lost David for a few minutes. We'll give him a few minutes to get his. They are calling up. up. David, we just lost a few minutes there. Oh, sorry. Oh. Great back. No, that's excellent. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Do I need to start again or? Um... No, no, no. Maybe just the last right. couple. Of uh, I was just saying um, we've done lots of work on provenance, but bookbinding is still very much uh, neglected out in the cold. Uh, we don't look enough at historic bookbindings and ask the right questions about them. How many people, when they're calling up books in rare book reading rooms, stop to look at the binding and say, well, what, what can this binding tell me about this book and its individual history? Because bindings are absolutely the first bits of books that we experience uh, when when we first encounter them they're very much part of that that influence that the whole book creates manifests um, for its for its users so we do need to um, think more about historic book bindings all kinds of historic book bindings and ask those kinds of questions and if it's an issue for hand press period book bindings, I, I think it's even more an issue for 19th and 20th century book bindings, um, which are still very unstudied, undocumented, uh, an awful lot of useful work remains to be done. So I was, um, I was delighted when last year I had an opportunity to um, help Chris Fripp a bit in his um, work uh, doing his dissertation on Victorian bindings. Um, uh, I supervised, his, or I was one of the supervisors of his thesis, um, and I entirely agreed with um, the other UCL supervisor who thought it was undoubtedly one of the best pieces of work uh, that she'd read as a, as a dissertation that year, which is obviously why it, uh, it won the medal. Um, uh, so Chris did a lot of um, good work on 19th century cloth bindings, um, surveyed various libraries, uh, did a lot of work with the Welcome collections, UCL collections, etc. Um, uh, and I remember one of the one of the things that he said towards the end of his work, he said that he'd done this surveying work, uh, working around various rare book libraries and asking the librarians, how much detail do you put into the cataloging of your 19th century cloth bindings? Um, how much do researchers ask about them, use them? How much help do you give, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and I, I, I remember he was, um, he was a bit puzzled, um, if not a little bit downcast, when the answer to that was often, well, mm, yeah, not, uh, not actually all that much, which I think is a perfect illustration of the point I was making earlier, that we need to do more work on these things, raise their profile, um, explain why they are interesting and why we should give them more attention. Um, uh, so uh, any of those curators who are out there right now and everyone else who is part of this session, I know that by the time You've, you've come to the end of Chris's talk, you undoubtedly will not 
think like that about Victorian bindings ever again um, uh, because he will undoubtedly uh, raise their profile and help to demonstrate why they are interesting and why we should look at them and pay them more attention. Um, so that is absolutely enough from me. Um, I am no more than part of the warm-up act uh, the main event is Chris Fripp, and I shall hand back over to Tabitha um, to formally introduce him, um, and I shall turn off my camera. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was a wonderful introduction. And I think it's going to be interesting to see if um, Chris's research um, can start to get people in my position as rare books librarians, rethinking the uh, date at which we take a rare book seriously enough to provide those detailed catalogue records. So Chris has worked at the Welcome uh, Collection Library. He's also worked um, cataloguing 19th century books at the Charterhouse and at many other libraries. I'm just going to hand over to Chris now um, so that you can show us uh, some of the wonderful uh, okay, well, hello everyone, and thanks for attending this latest instalment of UCL's Rare Books Club, which I hope you'll agree has produced some very interesting talks so far. The bulk of my talk takes you through the history of publishers' bindings in the 19th century, and with a particular focus on their materiality. I'm also going to spend a bit of time discussing the dissertation I completed for the Library and Information Studies MA last summer. And this looked at the extent to which publishers' cloth bindings are accommodated by research libraries from a collection management and descriptive, descriptive cataloguing point of view. So without further ado, let me share my slides. OK, so in the hand press period, the production of books in leather bindings was complemented by an extensive trade in paper bindings. By the end of the 18th century, it was relatively common to be purchased in thin paper covered boards with paper spines. These books could then be bound separately according to the tastes and budgets of the owner who bought them. The beginning of the 19th century, however, sparked a revolution in the British book trade and bindings changed accordingly. Archibald Leighton, a London bookbinder, was the first to develop cloth boards as a less transient alternative to paper boards. He achieved this through reinforcing cotton, calico, with a starch filler, thus making it stiff and impervious to adhesives. William Pickering began retailing Leighton's cloth bound books around 1825 although this date has been disputed. Some of Pickering's earliest examples include the Diamond Classics, a miniature series of classical works printed in partnership with Charles Correll. Pictured here is an example housed by UCL, a book of poetry by Francesco Petrarch, and it measures only nine centimetres in height. I should point out that although the book was published in 1822, it's highly unlikely the book was actually bound in 1822. Dating cloth, especially in this early period, is a tricky business without the use of external evidence such as binders records or publishers records. When casing arrived in the mid to late 1820s, the process or, or the process of gluing text, box, text blocks straight into prefabricated covers, book production came and became far more efficient. In the past, European bindings tend to be made with laced in sewing supports, a durable yet more time consuming approach. By contrast, casing required less skill and could be made in volume. It also became possible to issue whole editions of books with identical, identical covers. All of which represented a commercially viable means of keeping pace with the nation's rapidly growing reading public. During the early 1830s, 1830s sorry, cloth could be decorated with an all-over relief pattern by passing it through the heated rollers of an embossing machine. Graining, as a procedure became to be known, 
brought with it the added benefit of disguising the cloth's natural weave, which was not to everyone's liking at the time. In fact, the dictates of taste demanded the earliest cloth bind and grains simulate Morocco or goatskin leather, a material then synonymous with elegance and respectability. And here I pulled together a selection of sample grains for you to see, and all available from the Library Company of Philadelphia's website. If you want to zoom in and out of the slide, just select the show view controls icon to the left side of the display and use a toolbar as necessary. The earliest grains are presented at the top. So along with the Morocco grain in the previous slide, there's also diaper grain, rib grain and rib Morocco grain. Then later on, you get ripple grain, wave grain, sand grain, sand grain, sorry. And on the next slide, you have checkerboard grain, hexagon grain, clamshell grain and so forth. So in effect, you have a whole taxonomy of cloth grains springing up between the 1830s and the 1860s. And for those of you among us who are rare books catalogers, the best controlled vocabulary available for cloth, cloth grains is the Art and Architecture Thesaurus. The AAT provides 23 descriptive terms for cloth grains, which is quite good when you compare it to the RBMS, which has none, and the Gartus, which also has none. The application of gold blocking straight to cloth was also developed by Archibald Leighton in 1831. Within a few years, gold blocking was supplemented by blind blocking, while the mid 1840s saw the development of ink blocking. This technique was used more selectively at first, but technological development soon enabled far more generous applications. To the point where a book's covers could now accurately reflect their contents, like this pictorial example, The Scouring of the White Horse, published in 1859. That's UCL's copy, by the way. By the mid-19th century, publishing houses adopted sophisticated marketing strategies to accommodate consumer tastes. So a single edition of a book could be issued in a range of binding variants, like Charles Mackey's The Salamandrine, published by Ingram Cook and Company in 1853. UCL's copy, pictured here, is bound in a blue ribbed Morocco grain cloth, while the National Art Library cut, um, copy, which is pictured here, is bound in a green ripple grain cloth. And just to zoom in a little bit further, um, you can just about make out the rib Morocco grain running vertically in the UCL copy. And you can also see the gold block lettering on the left. And on the far right of the image, you can see part of the blind blocked border. For those of you who aren't familiar with blind blocking, it's when the machine makes an impression on the surface without gold or colour. The ripple grain in the National Art Library copy runs diagonally, rather like zigzags, and is probably best distinguished in the bottom left corner of the image. Hopefully you can just about make that. Elsewhere, UCL's copy of the Epicure's yearbook is bound in a purple ungrained cloth, pictured here, while the Welcome Collections copy is bound in a green ungrained cloth. Here. And speaking of sophisticated marketing techniques, publishing also commissioned artists to contribute their own cover designs. The exhibition movement of the 1840s played a big part in this process, culminating in the Great Exhibition of 1851. Artists were able to showcase the machine-made designs, which in my opinion compare extremely well to their handmade counterparts. By far the most prolific artist at the time was John Layton, who managed to produce over 400 designs over the course of his long career. Layton specialised in highly symmetrical layouts, usually comprising a central vignette, then moving out towards a rectangular border at the edge of the covers. A considerable number of Layton's design bear his monogram, a capital J and L, either on the covers or on the tail of the spine. 
So in this example, this is the peep at the pixels held by UCL. At the bottom of this centerpiece or vignette, you can just about make out the JL is monogrammed. And if I zoom in, you can see it more clearly there. Also notice the, the grain of the cloth, which I think is a sand grain cloth. And then another example, we have the poetical works of Kirk White, and you can see quite a densely gold block spine there. And somewhere along the bottom, the tail edge, you can see his JL monogram. And once again, if I zoom in, can you see the J and the capital L there? Just above the illustrated. Um, there is also evidence to, su to suggest that Leighton reverted to a single capital L towards the end of his career, um, monogram speaking wise. So here we have UCL's copy of Roundabout Piccadilly and Pall Mall, published by Smith, Elder and Company in 1870. But if you look more closely, you can see a gold block map of West London. And there at the bottom left corner is Leighton's L monogram. So moving on to William Harry Rogers, another artist. He was a contemporary of Leighton's and the eldest son of the celebrated woodcarver, William Gibbs Rogers. Along with Leighton, he co-designed the art journal illustrated catalogue, the industry of all nations for the great exhibition of 1851. Best known for his intricate style, Rogers executed designs for at least 21 different publishers during his lifetime. His work normally displays his full initials as a monogram, WHR, but it's all very understated and can be difficult to spot. So again, you've got this centerpiece. This is um, UCL's copy of the Art Journal Illustrated Catalogue. And somewhere amongst all this, you can spot his monogram, which I will zoom in again. And you can see beneath the 1851, can you make, work, make out the WHR? And that brings me to the, actually, I'll show you another example of William Harry Rogers. Um, this is the Travels of Rolando, um, which is stored at the British Library and published by George Rutledge in 1853. So this is, this is um, housed in the National Art Library. And once again, if I zoom in at the bottom of this, the vignette, you can see just about the WHR monogram. Okay, I'm just now going to switch slides. So bear with me a moment. Okay, so the, the next artist I wanna discuss is Owen Jones, and he was one of the chief organizers of the Great Exhibition and a key figure in the foundation of the South Kensington Museum, which is now the V&A, of course. Today is also regarded as one of the most distinguished binding designers of the 19th century. His finest work in cloth, in my opinion, is Tom Taylor's Burkitt Foster's Pictures of English Landscape, issued by George Rutledge and Sons in 1863. And that's pictured here, it's UCL's copy. But he did use other materials, like this gutter percha binding held by the National Art Library, which, featured, which features carved or pressed wooden boards. So you could say that high Victorian design was characterized by its lavish use of ornamentation and decorated lettering. If I go back to the first example, if you have a look at the lettering in the center, it's barely visible <coughs> amongst all that ornamentation. And if I go return to this second example, um, the wording is barely legible. It's in that kind of Gothic style um, and contained within the frames is more wording. But I think you have to be a paleographer to, uh, to, make, to make sense of it. OK, so during the last quarter of the 19th century, there was a significant reaction against this type of design, particularly from artists associated with the aesthetic movement or the arts and crafts movement. Arguably, this reaction started with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who designed several book covers in the 1860s, some of which were for his sister, Christina Rossetti. 
In this first example, housed in Senate House Library, is a green ungrain cloth. And you can see there's far less ornamentation here and with the only lettering found on the spine. The second example, also held by Senate House Library, is similar to the first in its simplicity of line. Charles Ricketts, he was an artist closely associated with the aesthetic movement in the 1890s and was greatly influenced by Rossetti and the pre-Raphaelites. I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So in 1894, <clears throat> Ricketts set up the Vale Press and produced book designs according to his own tastes without regard for commercial considerations. His most famous designs, however, were commercial, like this binding for John Gray's Silver Points, published by the Bodley Head in 1893. And this is housed in the British Library. As you can see, the covers feature a recurring willow leaf motif on a green background. Perhaps the wavy lines indicate a flowing stream. And elsewhere, Ricketts designed covers for Oscar Wilde, like this reissue of poems, which was published by the Bodley Head in 1892. This book was restricted to a print run of just 200 copies, all of them signed by the author, and was marketed as something representing taste, refinement and exclusiveness. Ricketts also designed the first edition of Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles, which was published by Osgood McIlvain and Company, also in 1892. And um, copy is actually part of the Tripodeca volume, which was, common, which was a common way of reading and consuming fiction at the time, and is held in the British Library. We're lucky enough that UCL, sorry, we're lucky enough to have a Charles Ricketts design here at UCL and it's um, The Pageant, which is edited by his lifelong partner, Charles Shannon. The design comprises six gold block doves carrying sprigs on an ungrained brown cloth, which is a world away from the covers of someone like Owen Jones. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention Aubrey Beardsley, who supplied the gold block designs for Oscar Wilde's English language edition of Salome, um, published in 1894. This edition is notable because it contains Beardsley's decadent and highly controversial illustrations for the play, which is still available to see at the Tate Britain exhibition today. I think it runs until September. Um, John Lane of the Bodley Head was responsible for choosing the blue canvas boards, which Wilde would later criticise in a letter of correspondence, and I quote, the cover of Salome is quite dreadful. Don't spoil a lovely book have simply a folded vellum wrapper with the design in scarlet, much cheaper and much better. The texture, of the, the texture of the present cover is coarse and common. It's quite impossible and spoils the real beauty of the interior. Everyone will say that it's coarse and inappropriate. I loathe it, so does Beardsley. Like all of Wilde's Bodley Head publications, Salome was sold as a limited edition and cleverly marketed as an aesthetic object of beauty. But it was still a publisher's cloth binding. Finally, William Morris um, wasn't a fan of machine-made books and instead drew inspiration from the old Venetian of the Renaissance. He used a Kelmscott press to produce books that, quote, would be a pleasure to look upon as pieces of printing and arrangements of type. Kelmscott press books were sold in temporary paper boards, um, which kind of brings us full circle to where we were at the end of the 18th century. Morris expected the owners of the books to have them bound individually, thus transforming them into what he considered honest works of art. But of course, it wasn't William Morris who finally put paid to publish his cloth bindings at the beginning of the 20th century. It was dust jackets and paperbacks. So when it came to writing my dissertation, I wanted to examine the status confirmed on publishers cloth bindings in research libraries. By that, I mean, I wanted to see just how they were accommodated from a collection management and descriptive cataloging point of view. I was concerned that many were being overlooked in favour of books dating from the hand press period, 
And I'm not just talking about bindings by the likes of Rossetti, um, Ricketts and Beardsley, you know, those books are often taken care of. Um, but the broader base of ordinary books, um, which were all but you know, forgotten about in stores or tended to be. And so I hope my findings would generate more awareness amongst library professionals, particularly those working in special collections. So I decided to survey the collections and catalogue records of four well-known organisations, as well as interview several of their employees. And really the aim of the survey was to gain a sense of professional practice as it existed in a represented sample of research libraries. Based on my own experience, I have to say I was expecting the worst. Um, at the time, I remember thinking, would these books even be categorised as special collections? But the results weren't as bad as I was expecting. So perhaps the amount of work required to help these treasures assume their rightful status isn't so substantial after all. So how did I know which publishers cloth bindings to sample? Well, I used a range of bibliographies and I would recommend Edmund King's Victorian trade, bind Victorian trade bindings in particular. In the end, I was only able to sample a total of 344 books, um, which doesn't sound a lot, especially in an age of big data, but it was for a single researcher who was working a full-time job at the same time. You also need to consider the restrictions most research libraries put in place on the number of store items you're able to call up to the reading room at one time. In some cases, circumstances were such I could only view up to five items a day. So it was just something I had to live with. So <clears throat> looking at the results, of the 344 books I requested for hands-on examinations, 139 were discovered not to be bound in publisher's cloth. In most cases, this was because they had been rebound in buckram cloth, presumably as a result of them being damaged in the past. However, the lack of binding information available in the catalogue records prevented these books from being detected and weeded out with a sample at an earlier stage. And I guess you could look upon this as an issue in itself, especially if you're a researcher you know, for traveling across the Atlantic to view these items. Of the remaining books, um, the good news is that 83% or 170 of 206 books were held as part of special collections rather than circulating collections. This meant the items were consulted under supervised conditions, like in a reading room, for example, and were more likely to be stored in the appropriate environmental settings. Of the 36 books that were held in circulating collections, 9% were available to take away as library loans, which wasn't so great, I guess. However, none of these books were available from open shelves, so they were less vulnerable to damage and theft as a result. I also looked at how many were digitised and found that 9% or 19 of 206 were available to view online. Elsewhere, 62 books had covers signed um, with an artist's monogram, of which 10%, or 6 of 62, had been inadvertently concealed with a wayward shelf mark label. Um, so that was the collection management side of things, and personally I thought those results weren't too bad at all. As far as descriptive cataloguing was concerned, I think this was an area where most significant gains could be made. Um, before I go into the results, I just want to show you a simple example of a catalogue record which I think contains adequate binding information. So as you can see, the book's title, author, publication statement, physical description and subjects, um, they're all present as normal as you would find in a conventional record. Um, you also have, a, you also have well, at the bottom, you have an extra note for binding information which contains a selective rather than an exhaustive description. I think that's sufficient. Um, you also have a name heading um, for the artist responsible for the cover design, as well as some form headings for extra details about the book's physical makeup. So in theory, if you performed a search for John Layton binding designer, the catalogue would retrieve all records of books with bindings designed by John Layton. And similarly, if you performed a search for bubble grain, 
the catalogue retrieve, would retrieve all records of books with bubble-grown bubble bindings. <clears throat> in reality, however, things tend to be a little bit different, as the following re results show. Nevertheless, I think it's important to acknowledge them. So first of all, only 28% of catalogue records, that's 58 of the 206 samples, included a note field with binding information of some sort. Within that figure, 61% of records, that's 35 of 57, included cloth colours in the description, while 12%, that's 6 of 50, included cloth grains where applicable. Seventy-four percent of records um, included other decorative elements of description, with gold and bl blind block blocking. Sorry, with gold and blind blocking being the most frequent. So seventy-four percent, yeah, forty-two out of fifty-seven. Where applicable, five percent of records um, contained a name heading for the binding designer. So that was four out of eighty-five. And those form headings I mentioned earlier appeared in 9% of records. So that was 19 of 206 records. Um, none of the form headings contained cloth grains in the description. So why do publishers' bindings fall short when it comes to descriptive cataloguing in research libraries? So the library professionals I interviewed explained there tended to be more focus on books of the hand press period rather than the machine press period. And um, this is reflected in rare books cataloguing standards, which until quite recently had always declared itself as being more applicable to books printed before the 19th century. Terminology was another factor. So whereas catalogers might recognize marbled or mopled calfskin leather, they were less familiar with di diaper grain or ripple grain cloth. Someone even suggested publishers' cloth bindings were quite conventional in their appearance by today's standards, which might explain a lack of interest from library professionals. And importantly, the interviewers also stated that they didn't receive many research inquiries about them, um, so their time was better off spent elsewhere. So with this information, I made a series of recommendations aimed at building their profile, that's publishers' cloth bindings profile, and generating more interest um, from researchers. So today I've decided not to go into too much detail as far as the descriptive cataloguing is concerned, because I think I'll just lose you with the technical jargon. On the collection management side, I did suggest featuring them more widely in the academic programmes of research libraries, which is kind of what I'm doing today. It's also fast approaching 200 years since the introduction of cloth bound books. So at some point, it would be great to organize an exhibition display celebrating the bicentenary. And the last thing I want to say is, increasing the profile of publishers cloth bindings won't work for every library. Even ones with principal strengths in the history of the book production or decorative arts, must juggle with the finite resources they have at their disposal. Publishers' cloth bindings don't exist in a vacuum either, which means the issues they face may well just be as pertinent um, to bindings of the 15th through to the 18th centuries. But most research libraries do have large collections of 19th century books, and it certainly doesn't hurt to look for ways to make them appeal as primary sources rather than outdated secondary sources. Thank you all for listening. And now I'm going to hand you back over to Tabitha, who will introduce the final part of the session, which is your questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. That's really wonderful. And this is genuinely an area that hasn't yet found its way, in, as you've just described, into the cataloguing training, I think, for, for rare books librarians, let alone into the standard uh, catalog and protocols. So if anybody has to rush off now, now is the moment. Um, thank you very much for attending. I wanted to say at the beginning a particular thank you and welcome to the apprentices that we have attending today, um, the bookbinding apprentices from the Royal Collection. So you're very welcome.
to be here. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me. Now is the section where we go to questions. And in the right hand side of your panel, if you click on that pink, <coughs> excuse me, on that pink dot to open the chat panel and click on the speech bubble and type your question in. So I'm going to do the best that I can to scan these down. So we have a question here, Chris. Um, are there good reference sources for catalogers who do want to learn more about the subject? I think you just need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I'm just unmuting myself now. Um, yeah, earlier in the talk, I mentioned the um, Victorian trade bindings. It's a published bibliography by Edmund King. That was that was so invaluable um, when it came to identifying books to search for in collections. I guess um, like cataloging resources. I mentioned the Art and Architecture um, website. That contains a really good list of authoritative terms um, to describe cloth grains, for example. Um, a bibliographer called Angela Krupp, I think she carried out the latest research on um, 19th century bindings, um, and her work is available on the Library Company of Philadelphia's website. It has it, it provides her taxonomy of cloth grains. I think there's about 90 different grains. Um, so that the, the, the resources are out there. I think it's just a case of um, us as library professionals to, to, to start using them really. Lovely, thank you. We've got a question, if you can, you know, it might be asking too much, but whether it's possible for you to summarise now um, in a short space of time, your recommendations, particularly from the perspective of curators and catalogers. I don't know how you think about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking of other important work in addition to what I've already described. There is, um, you'll find a, a number of online exhibitions actually. I think the University of Columbia in New York, they did an exhibition in 1998. It's available, if you, if you Googled it, you'd be able to see it. Um, Columbia University publishes cloth bindings. Um, there are other institutions. I think the University of North Texas did something. Um, University of Wisconsin um, did a big project. Um, and also, if you have a look at the um, the British Library, um, the database of book bindings, that, that contains a lot of Edmund King's work, actually. I think now there's about 750 entries, publishers cloth bindings, so there's plenty there. Thank you. And I'm aware that we may be lucky enough to be able to read some of this in a published article soon. Yes, yeah, so I, am, I am in the process of uh, turning this into an article. Um, I was hoping to have it done sooner than, than now, really. But this summer has been pretty intense, I have to say, um, you know, with this, with this crisis we have uh, upon us. And um, certainly working at UCL, transferring our academic support program online. But I hope now that project has, um, well, we, uh, we're certainly we're really set for next term. I'm hoping to be able to spend more time with it. And, uh, you know, who knows, by the end of the year, maybe next year, more realistically. Fantastic. And first of all, I have to say that I'm partly responsible for distracting you by having you working for us this last summer, doing a fantastic job getting events like this up and running and preparing for teaching online. Um, but also to say there's lots of enthusiastic comments in the chat to say that people would love to see this public. I've got a question here about spines. I'll just read this out. Due to their material design, many of these bindings end up with spines and hinges in poor state. Now that's true. Um, so this person asked, why did publishers never take steps to remedy this? I don't know if there's an answer to that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I suppose it's just the price you pay. I mean, you could, you know, case bindings um, were cheap and easy to produce. You could um, print thousands of copies of a single edition 
Um, but as a result, you 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 use you lose the um, what's the word the robustness mm. of traditional sewn in bindings. Mm. Um, but I think you know a lot a lot of these a lot of these books have you know survived. They're they're in decent condition. I mean you you do get the odd. Well, I suppose you get a significant amount that have been damaged. But um, yeah, they 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 are available. I think. Um, in addition to you know the natural wear and tear, uh, in maybe earlier in the 20th centuries, libraries had a tendency to be really trigger happy with their um, rebind rebinding programs, and I guess um, original publishers' cloth bindings were casualties along the way, which is a shame. Um, yeah. The early, the early bindings, the early publishers' bindings. How many in uh, with the with the, the same type of cloth and the same kind of design would people have could been producing? Because we saw two slightly different um, expressions of that early, those early designs in one of your examples. Yeah, I mean they they, they were. I think they were they were pretty stra straightforward. They were the, the earliest ones were ungrained calico. Cloth grains didn't appear till 1831. So, so that example I showed you, the, the diamond um, classics, William Pickering, um, it was published in 1822. Um, we know that the, the, the particular cloth grain that appears on that book didn't arrive till 1831. So in theory, um, that, could, that book could have been sat in sheets for up to a decade before it was finally bound and sold. But um, yeah, th th those early th those early cloths um, they were they were ungrained, and the earliest grains were leather, you know, simulating leather, and the other earliest, I guess, was the diaper grain, the diamond shaped cloth. Um, but once you, once once you get into the 1840s and 50s, the you get far more far more diversity in the grains. Yeah. Interesting. Sorts. And we've actually got a comment from a conservator here. Um, I all, oh, the, the chat's very lively. Let me just find it again. Here we go. I all thought that the heavily carved boards were papier mache or painted plaster, very frequently black and jet lined. Yes. And this one did look like wood, I agree. But could it have been painted or grained to make it look like wood? Yeah, the, the majority of those um, gutter percha bindings have boards made of papier mache, and they, they they're made to look like wood. Um, but the, that Owen Jones example, it is actually wooden boards. I was uh, it was something I had to really kind of um, you know check on multiple sources, but, it, but apparently it is wood. I don't know precisely how it's made. It's it's either carved or it's or it's pressed, but it's certainly a very unique object. Yeah. Mm. It's a wonderful example. We've got uh, a question about how the designs were made. Uh, this person says, has your research made you interested in how these blocked designs were actually manufactured? Often huge heated presses were required to get them into the cover. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I've thought about that. I mean, I, I don't know a huge amount, but yeah, as far as I'm aware, um, gold blocking designs were used with yeah, a pair of heated um, presses, and then you would just press down um, the, what, what's the word? <laughs> the, the impression on the surface of the cloth, yes. That's it, that's it. Um, and we've got hundreds of consumptions. Which, been, which yeah. I guess would have been a far more efficient and quicker way of doing it than actually, you know, hand tool designs of previous centuries. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, we've got another comment. There were canvas school books before this, often yes. stab stitching to hold the text yeah. block, which are wonderful things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, cloth, book cloth, it wasn't the first textile to be used. I mean, yeah, in the 18th century, you had canvas um, and people were always using silk, but that was more of a novelty kind of cover and it was very it was very expensive it certainly couldn't be mass-produced mm -hmm. 
Now we're coming up to two o'clock. So again, if you have to rush off, do feel free. Thank you for coming and do book in for next week. But we'll stand here for the end of our question. There's a lovely comment here, Chris. Thanks very much, Chris. When I did my library studies at Columbia in the early 90s, our professor Terry Bellinger signaled the need for more research on these types of findings. So it's nice to see someone taking an interest in them. Yeah, <laughs> and hopefully more people will. Hopefully. And to follow that up, I just wondered whether you or David Pitson, if he's um, uh, still on the line, have any suggestions about how we can um, improve catalogers' understanding of this? A talk such as this are really helpful if you if you were to be able to publish your research, that would help. Um, but that's still just a small part. I wonder how we can get these, this, the terminology and the uh, basic skill to recognise what we're talking about into cataloguing guidelines that are very full for earlier items. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I don't know if David's out there to make any suggestions. Either. Um, I mean, the terminology is out there, certainly as far as the Art and Architecture Thesaurus is concerned. However, you know, other organisations like the RBMS, which is traditionally, you know, so important and, and catalogues rely on the resources produced by RBMS. Um, we could even lobby them to, to, to include more um, descriptive terms for 19th century publishers' cloth bindings. Um, the cataloguing standards, the, is it, um, DCRMB, Descriptive Cataloging of Rare Books and um, Rare Materials and then Books, sorry. I said I mentioned in, 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 the, in the talk that it wasn't until recently really that they opened it up to books that post-dated um, 1801. And that was around 2007. But, as, but I, the way I see it, the damage was already done, you know, for decades, well, for at least 30 years, people all were told to catalogue books pre-1801. So it's hard to, you know, change around that culture. So I suppose so, a lot of this is about the constant creeping cut-off dates that uh, modern lending libraries have transferring or weeding out any of their material into special collections. But David, do you have any suggestions about how we can try to get this terminology into the mainstream? Well, I guess the other thing to stir in is the um, is is raising interest not just in the rare books curatorial community, but also in the academic user community. You know, I think we need to evangelize not only within the profession, but pick up on that point that Chris made that um, uh, you know catalogers say they're not putting a lot of effort into this because they're not getting a lot of researcher inquiries um and you know and i think this applies to historic book bindings generally it's not just 19th century cloth bindings um getting the the research community the academics the postgraduates the people who are handling this stuff in reading rooms all the time um and writing about it and thinking about it and um, getting through to them the importance of stopping and looking at these features of the books and thinking what that can tell them about the impact, the influence, etc., of the books um, is another important aspect of this whole thing. Because I think realistically, uh, catalogers, library professionals are driven by what their users want and what they ask for. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's been a lot more effort gone into capturing provenance data, uh, putting information about fauna ownership and marginalia into library catalogues because researchers have picked up on the importance and the interest of that. And there's a real academic community working on that kind of stuff. And, you know, we I think it, we need collectively to to push that, um, you know, the opportunities, the evangelization, whatever you want to call it, into the uh, into those academic users. So, you know, I th thinking about 
introducing bindings and thinking about bindings to the kinds of sessions that that people give to visiting groups of postgrads um, to academics to the lecturers uh, to the professors etc uh, is an important part of this whole push because when the academics and the researchers and the users want more of this kind of information and more focus on this then the professional work will follow um, so i think we need to think about that that side of it too thanks that's really interesting and it's a bit circular because there's not going to be requests from readers for the books if the catalogers haven't put that information into a catalog record and if they're only putting information in when there are requests then you you end up going nowhere right. exactly absolutely thank you very much there's a few nice comments here um picking up on some of that um there's a comment on the spines um again from a conservator very worthy of further understanding before they are all obliterated by indiscriminate rebacking yes and a comment on the saying um i wonder how much an attractive binding encourage the spread of literacy i've long felt there's a sense of snobbery in book history that prioritized the wealthy owner of a hand press period over the mass market and i think that ties in with what you were saying david about uh, training librarianship training as well um now i think there's such a lively chat we shall save that so we're hoping to um be able to make this recording available we first of all do need to provide captions to meet our accessibility uh guidelines and so it it will take us a few weeks to get this recording up online but we shall do that and we'll email everybody who's attending. If you do have any further questions, we've put in the chat the email address there to send those to. And we'll also be emailing you with a feedback form and it would be really helpful if you were able to add your comments to that afterwards. That will help us to organize future sessions like this. Um, so, Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And thank you all for your fantastic contribution and uh, wonderful questions as well. Um, please do book for next week. And we wish you a very nice week. To leave, you just need to move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen again. And to the left, there is a picture of a person with a green tick. If you click on that, you'll see the option to leave the session. We look forward to seeing you next week. A huge thank you to Chris for this fantastic and very important work and to David Pearson for joining us. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.